Samuel Boyne, I teach at Columbia University. Uh, I'm a modern European intellectual historian. I've worked on the history of philosophy, also the history of law and human rights. Well, like most things, it has some old components and some new components. Obviously, the basic idea of a human right is very old. People debate whether it was invented in Rome or by medieval philosophers or by early modern thinkers like John Locke. I've tried to insist that whatever answer we reach, we still have to investigate the political uses of human rights. Uh, in the American and French Revolution, the, the, the goal was not to light a candle or save the world or intervene to help the suffering abroad. It was to, if you like, save ourselves, to uh, unseat our king or chasten his power uh, in the name of our rights. And often the tool was violence, so rights were a revolutionary idea for a long time. But they could also serve other purposes. I think in the 19th century, most of those people who talked about the rights of man as they were then known were defenders of freedom of contract or private property against things like social regulation. So we have to bear in mind that human rights are old, but focus on how new some of our uses of human rights really are. You know, historians actually, I think, can, can cast a lot of light on that question. They can't always resolve what we should do now in our current crisis in Syria. Uh, Elsewhere. But they can helpfully show that in, in the heat of decision making, um, you know, a lot of perspective can, can be forsaken that we can restore through doing careful historical study. So, humanitarian intervention, we now know, thanks to, you know, a, a series of very important books, is old. I mean, it probably started out in the early modern period when Protestants wanted to protect other Protestants from. Um, you know, religious persecution in other states or jurisdictions. Uh, but in the 19th century, it was really bound up with what was called the Eastern Question, the slow decline, uh, often called, of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and of course, there was justifiable outrage uh, uh, that European publics, and also by the end of the 19th century, American published publics directed at uh, what were presented as Ottoman backwardness, um, including some, you know, very regrettable episodes of bloodshed and repression. Of course, Europeans and Americans never focused on their own malfeasance. This was the era when their empire building was at its high point. Uh, but what we can find that's often disturbing is that the outrage of a public that politicians know how to manipulate by portraying the suffering of, of people abroad can serve great power agendas. You know, it, it was remarkable in his speech recently to the American public justifying the Syrian intervention before he was forced to pull back. Barack Obama not only invoked Syrian suffering, but mentioned the children of Syria upwards of 10 times in a very short speech. Because he knows, like any good politician, um, what, what convinces us, what appeals to our feelings. Uh, but in the end, he is in charge of a great power. And most often historians find that while moral ideas aren't negligible, they matter. They have a force in history. Interests, including great power interests, usually win the day. And so I think as members of the public, we have to be aware of this confluence of power and morality in history. I think very cautiously now, after a period of um, enthusiasm that didn't take account of that very important question. So one thing to say, just as a prefatory note, is that the, the universe of human rights is very large. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights doesn't just guarantee the right to be free from atrocity. It guarantees a huge range of rights, including economic and social rights. And uh, the reason a lot of us are interested in human rights are because of that broad promise. But it's true that in especially prominent debate, it's really atrocity that gets our attention. 
and there's a very real question which you voice about how we keep from making the situation worse, and the answer is we don't know. Uh, and it behooves any statesman who's going to appeal to us to support his intervention or her intervention uh, to explain to us why the price is worth paying. It's not that, of course, we don't care about the suffering of Syrian children, but someone is going to have to pick up the pieces. There has to be some thought about how a stable regime is going to emerge on what is normally going to be the ruins of a regime. In Libya, our UN resolution told us to protect civilians, but in fact we went into top of the despot. And as we know, it's much harder to create a stable regime once we've destroyed one, uh, given our memories of Iraq uh, and the present histories of Egypt and Syria. And so I think we're, we're in a learning process. The president has created an atrocities prevention board, uh, and it's, I know, given a lot of very cautious, careful thought to putting our moral exigency into a broader framework concerned with larger consequences. And so for people like me, it's a wonderful thing that we're learning caution uh, and learning context.